This is One on One with Jasper Cole, Hollywood's bad guy, and so much more. Actor, talent manager, producer, and more. Now he's sitting down with today's top newsmakers from entertainment, politics, pop culture, and beyond. This is One on One with Jasper Cole. All right, all right. Howdy, 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 and welcome to One on One with Jasper Cole. We are coming to you live today from Sunset Gower Studios right here in Holly Weird, California. It's another Wednesday. Big shout out to my producer, Mr. John Williams. Hey, hey buddy. Hey, Jasper. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Just got some lunch in. I'm ready for this. <laughs> ready to rock and roll? Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, speaking of everyone, please go over to Twitter and follow us at one on one J. Cole and Facebook, one on one with Jasper Cole. And you can also go to my website, jaspercole.com, click on the icon for the show, and you will also find our amazing 24 affiliate advertisers. Um, their ads are there. And when you see a product that you like, click on the ad, and our show promo code is embedded, and we get credit for it. Mm-hmm. So we're really grateful to have all of them on board. Um, I read them all last week, and I think I'll, I won't read them today. There's so many. But you can go to the website. Now, you can also go to um, ubnradio.com and go to you know our show, mm-hmm. One-on-One with Jasper Cole, and click on the host page, and you'll see all the ads there as well, yep. which is great. Well, so, well, JW, welcome back, because, you know, we took a break last week yeah. because of the Republican debate. Yeah. And you were so uh, fortunate you got to be there live in Simi <laughs> Valley along with uh, yeah. UBN that was live streaming. So yeah. tell everyone, how was that experience? It was pretty pretty amazing, actually. You know, um, my first time being at a political convention or uh, yeah. debate, I should say. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting from, you know, I think we got there at uh, around 7.30, started setting up around 9, and we were there until around 10 o'clock at night. Oh, my God. So it was a long day, but, uh, you know, uh, Tony and I took turns uh, running the board and, uh, you know, corralling everybody. Were you, were you in the spin room? Were uh, we like were right, right th- above the spin room. We were actually yeah. looking down on the spin room. We were on a place or an area called Radio Row. Okay. And, um, yeah, so, and then we were interviewing and uh, right directly over the spin room. So, you want, you know, when you watch back, because f- I think we recorded some of these Interviews. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it was, well, I guess, it was, you know, it's weird. I'm assuming you're a Democrat. I don't know. I should yeah. say that. No, I yeah. am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so I'm more, I guess I'm more independent. I, I'm more about, you know, um, who I feel would do a great job versus right. uh, any political party, exactly. Ex- but, um, you know, but I'm, I'm more, at this point, Democratic than anything, yeah. Yeah, I always say I'm independent. I lean liberal. I mm-hmm. mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely liberal on social issues. I might be a little more conservative fiscally and, and stuff like that. But, yeah. um, but you know, ultimately, I don't think I, I've never voted Republican yet. I don't think that's <laughs> coming. <so. laughs> yeah. But speak, well, going to the debate. So I did watch the whole three hours. And um, were you able to were you watching them on a while it was happening? Well, we were watching them pretty much on, on a, a live monitor because on the monitor, yeah, yeah. Where, where we were at. Um but yeah, it it was pretty interesting because you know, I had never been to the Reagan Library before, and mm-hmm. uh, I haven't either. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful place. And Simi Valley is beautiful. Um, just on the way there, it was gorgeous. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a a pretty interesting place when you get a bunch. Well, I think we're like twenty Republican candidates there. <laughs> Well, it seemed like 200. Yeah, I yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. And then... Well, I watched the... You know, I did the, the, the pre one, the smaller table. I don't know what they call it. The happy hour, the whatever. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that one, you know, was surprising because Lindsey Graham, who was that sort of... I always thought was sort of a racist Southern, you know, senator. He actually came off sort of the best in the first one. But I think we all agree and the pundits all agree that Carly Fiorina sort of mopped the floor in the second one. Yeah. The big one. Well, when they went back and fact-checked everybody, she didn't do so well, but yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> she, she went off without Planned Parenthood. And yeah. just FYI, it, there is no video. The video does not exist with, you know, ba- ba- a baby on a table with body parts. Yeah. So, um, and if it, if, if it was ever shown, it was doctored according to Planned Parenthood, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... 
so yeah, so I th- I was look, I'm not a um, Republican. But I loved, I was hoping someone like her would come in and sort of put Donald Trump in his place, Mm -hmm. finally. And it was almost like, you know, when you have a female in the room, it it, it kind of makes it sort of like the mother in the room. And I I love how she just kind of popped his hands. And and I I thought Donald finally showed, you know, the true cracks in the veneer this Mm -hmm. time. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the polling afterwards, he, it's the first time he's actually gone down, but she went up to like 15%. Yeah, um, from three percent or something. I I will tell you this. I'm she's pretty impressive, especially on her foreign policy mm-hmm. uh, platforms, um, because I've listened to her. She she seems to be one of the few people that actually has a a foreign policy plan for what she would do day one in office, uh-huh. which is impressive. But I don't know. She she kind of uh, it seems to me like she may be a good vice president candidate. You know. Yeah depending on who the uh, the nominee is. But, well, it was, gr- yeah. I, I, it was great to watch it. It was great knowing that you guys were out there. It was a big coup for UBN. Yeah, so, it was great. Um, yeah. And I guess the other big event this past weekend w- were the Emmys. I don't mm-hmm. know if you got to see the, the Emmys on Sunday night. I got to see some clips. I didn't actually watch the show, though. No. Yeah, I watched it because Andy Samberg hosts, and, you know, I just worked with him on Brooklyn Nine-Nine a few weeks oh, before. Oh, yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, I think that episode's coming on, like, October 11th. But um, but I wanted to watch him, and it's interesting. Watching it, he he ha- he has some really great jokes and lines. I think it's, it was kind of those that you, you laughed at more after the fact. In the room, well, first of all, I always say that is, like, the toughest. First of all, the uh, Industry, you know, audiences are so jaded. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to make them laugh. I mean, even on the Oscars, you know, (laughs) so I always say it's a really thankless job to host those shows. Yeah. But um, but it was so great to see, you know, people like Amy Schumer show one, of course, Viola Davis. And my favorite was Regina King winning because Regina has been around since 227, Mm -hmm. you know, and been doing amazing work. I was thrilled for her. And um, yes. The, the diversity that was winning, and uh, you know, I, it was it was nice that it seemed to be a, a, a cross section of winners. I, other than Julia Louis Dreyfus, who wins way too many Emmys, <laughs> I, I, I'm just not a fan. I God bless her. I know people love her and they love her on Veep, but I think she's overrated. So uh-huh. and it, and you know, watch me get a job on Veep. But there I'm just go. putting. I'm just being honest. <laughs> I I was pulling for Lisa Kudrow and. Uh, and the comeback in that category. So yeah, no, that's but, that, that was a great show. The comeback. Yeah, are they going to bring it back? Yeah. I wonder. The comeback got renewed. Yeah. Oh great. Right. And um, also, what got renewed today is I am Kate. Yeah, I heard about season, that. Yeah. Which you know, I had already a couple weeks ago. I discussed my. I'm done with that, but I'm hoping. C- coming back season two, I'm hoping they're going to focus. And I think you guys mentioned this even on Dale's show today. I agree with Emerson. If they really focus on the core group of ladies around her, mm-hmm. I think that's going to be much better. So, in other words, I am Kate. It should be called I am Kate with less Kate. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because yeah. the other people seem to be a lot more interesting, interesting in people. my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I don't know. Are you an Empire fan? I am. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Because tonight is the big yeah. you know, season premiere of mm-hmm. Empire. Yeah. And... Um, that's going to be amazing because you know that that show came on last year and just blew everything competition out of the water. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, Taraji P Henson as Cookie is a scene stealer. So that's coming <laughs> on. It's one of those shows. Can you you sort of wonder can they can they maintain the hype? Mm-hmm. Because that kind of happened with Twin Peaks. You recall, you know, Twin Peaks was like the hottest thing, and then it died after two seasons or maybe three. It's all about the writing, right? Yeah, I think Heroes had the same thing. Although mm-hmm. they're doing this. Heroes reboot, which is shot right there on right here on the lot. Yeah, uh, Sunset Gower. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm really excited about Empire tonight. I am and too. Tivo, Tivo is set on that. I guess the other big story, and I'm not a Catholic, but you know the Pope, the Pope. has visited <laughs> the U.S. Yeah. after going to Cuba. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on this Pope? I, I a lot of people seem to think he's been the most inclusive of all the popes we've had so the catholics have had so far yeah i would agree yeah i would agree yeah i think he's uh shown a little more compassion for the underdog Mm -hmm. um i mean he's still of course against gay marriage and and you know probably homosexuality in general but 
<laughs> Listen, he's been a lot more receptive than the the other ones. But yeah, apparently, yeah it's just a big deal. I'm, I'm not Catholic, so I don't quite get it. Um, you know, I'm not really religious at all. Mm-hmm. I, I I kind of kind of shy away from when you're putting these people up on a pedestal. But but if it's helping, you know what? If it's helping people and bringing them together, that's let's just kumbaya and everyone get along, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But um. But yeah, so I think I think oh, also I want to say a big shout out to Elaine Hendricks because her series uh, Rock and Roll uh, Dennis with Dennis Leary got picked up on a TNT for a second season. Also, congrats, Elaine. And she's amazing. She's yeah. amazing on that. But um, well, listen, I'm really excited about today's guest. We yeah. have master illusionist and magician Michael Grantanetti, and Michael has two television shows. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one, Masters of Illusion, just concluded their second season on the CW. But his other show, uh, Don't Blink, is a big hit on Pop TV, and he is—I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. I was watching his stuff. You know, I'm fascinated by what he does in general. And I, what I really want to talk to him about is where in the hell does this start? You know what I mean? Like where. I, I, I want to know, like, as a kid, I'm sure he had this, like, passion as a kid um, for this. I want to hear who his influences were, and I'm really excited to to have him on today. So let's take our first break. Alrighty. And when we come back, we'll be joined by master illusionist Michael Grantonetti. You are watching and listening to One on One with Jasper Cole, and we will be right back. All right, and we're back, Jasper. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to One on One with Jasper Cole. And we are joined in studio now by my other producer extraordinaire, Mr. Dominic Friesen. Hey, Dominic. Hello, hello. And our very special guest, master illusionist and magician, Mr. Michael Grandinetti. Hey, buddy, how are you? Hey, good, Jasper. How are you? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And listen, congratulations, not, not just... Do you just have one TV show? You have two TV shows. It has been a busy year, for sure, um, but I'm very thankful for that. We have had so much fun with these shows. Well, I have been watching you and your, your stuff, and it's, I'm just, it's mind-blowing. Um, let's get the plugs out of the way first so we can make sure everyone knows. the uh, Master Illusion, Masters of Illusion, is, the series finale is this variety on the CW at 8 p.m. Correct, yes. And then your other show, uh, Don't Blink, on Pop TV. Now, the next episode is October 1st. Is that right? Well, no, Don't Blink is coming back. It ran for the summer, and then it's going to be coming back in the fall. We don't have a start date for it yet, but I'm told uh, late fall, probably around November-ish. But uh, I'll certainly keep you posted. And there's a lot of magic coming up on on Don't Blink, so I can't wait for you to see it. Oh, that's fantastic. And then, of course, you have your website, uh, Michael. your name, Michael grandinetti.com and it's g-r-a-n-d-i-n-e-t-t-i dot com correct big long italian name i was going to say uh (laughs) yeah italian for sure um and then also are you on twitter or facebook or any of that stuff yeah on twitter i'm grandinetti mg on facebook i'm michael grandinetti and instagram we can't forget instagram oh that's right yeah the new uh, well you're young i was gonna say that's (laughs) what the kids are doing now so (laughs) you know it's it's i'm hooked on all of them i gotta tell you so so yeah i always welcome people to connect i love to hear from everybody and uh and thank you for uh thank you for the little plug on that i appreciate it oh absolutely well you know i i I always like to hear about people's journey because I'm fascinated by it. I I'm I'm just like you grew up in Pennsylvania, right? That's where you're from. Correct, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, wow, the great city. Um, and and from what I was reading about you, uh, clearly you had this like uh, this interest in in magic as a, as a kid. Where did that? Looking back, do you know where that started or how it started? Yeah, well, I'm I'm. A really lucky guy who found what he loved to do early in life. Uh, like a lot of kids, I got a magic set for Christmas, right. um, and for some reason, I never grew up. I just I knew at that point in time that this is it. Magic's going to be my life. And looking back on it, I go, Wow, how do you have that awareness at five years old to even, you know, know what you want to do with your life? But I was hooked by it, and everything I did from that point on was kind of driven by that goal of becoming a magician. And you know. There was never, I know a lot of kids have, especially at that young age, they want to be football players or they want to be, you know, they have dreams of doing a lot of different things. Um, For me, I never got off the path. There was never a point in my life where 
there was ever a plan B or an alternate. It was just, mm. this is what I'm going to do. So I'm very lucky to, to have kind of, uh, you know, had that sense of just knowing what my passion was. Well, you know, I talk I, I, as an actor myself, and I mean, in, I think in many ways, well, you're an actor. I mean, I, I mean that in the in sense of being a performer, because when I watch your shows, you it's not your standard magic act. I mean, you bring in theater to it, you know, and music and dance and everything. But I think you're so right about we're all so lucky if we find this passion at, at an early age. But were you was like were Penn and Teller influences? I mean, I'm trying to think back. Did you have other magicians that you kind of like? Once you got to an age where you could look at other magicians, did you have influences? People that you loved? You know, I loved watching everything about magic that I possibly could. So the answer to that question is yes. I can't name like a specific this one person or these mm -hmm. two people. You know, were were uh, you know it? I would just tell you that every time. I would, let me put it this way. So when I was a kid and the newspaper would come on Saturday, I would the first thing I'd run for would be the TV listings. I'd go through line by line, every talk show, every sitcom, to see if a magician was going to be guesting that week. And I would wow. set a VCR tape. Remember VCRs? Oh, I would set a yes. VCR tape. And, VHS. And, uh, oh, yeah. And, and I would tape them. And I would, I would anything I could watch that had magic in it, I, I loved it. I loved it. And I still feel that way this day. I just love, I love what I do, and I love watching magic. So how do you, well, how do you develop each act or each illusion? That's a good question. You know, it takes, it takes a lot of work, more work than I think people realize. You know, mm -hmm. as magicians, we want it to look effortless. We want mm -hmm. it to look like we're just going out there and the magic is just automatically happening. Mm -hmm. Behind that, uh, you know, uh, effortlessness is many, many years of work. I'll get ideas from, uh, sometimes it'll come from music. There's a piece we do in my show where I, I walk through a steel wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, you come from Pittsburgh, you have to have steel in your show. <laughs> and uh, But we have this seven-foot-tall steel wall. We have it examined by the audience, and I walk right through the center of it. Mm -hmm. And the idea for that came from this piece of music I heard. And when I heard it, just instantly in my mind, I saw one hand coming through the wall, and then another wow. hand coming through the wall, and then pulling my body through the wall. Um, a piece that we did on a show for NBC called The World's Most Dangerous Magic was this big, dangerous escape where I got chained up uh, between flaming spikes. The idea for that came from music as well. Hmm. So sometimes it'll come from music. Other times it'll come from an idea. Uh, for example, a, a classic premise of magic. You know, if you want to... A, a classic in magic is sawing somebody in half, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're working on a way right now to do it uh, in a way that's never been done before. Uh, completely different. Uh, very unique, very visual, and, and, and a lot of fun at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's taking a classic premise and kind of... Uh, doing it in our own way. Okay. So, you know, the ideas come from a lot of places, but that's uh, one of the fun parts about what I do. And, and when you travel, I mean, you travel with a lot of equipment, mm. you mentioned earlier. Yeah, 15,000 pounds. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and but I love that. You know, my, my goal as a kid and my dream as a kid was to have the, the big show. Somebody asked me earlier, what's the difference between a magician and an illusionist? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, an, an illusionist uh, when, you know, that kind of connotates larger scale magic, making people mm -hmm. float in the air, making large ob objects disappear and appear. And that was my dream, w which is to do the big stuff. So, you know, it's logistically challenging to take that kind of show around, but I wouldn't trade it. That's that's the type of magic that I, I love. And what would you consider your, your your signature illusion to be thus far? I would like say levitation or. Yeah, I would say probably that that steel wall piece that we do uh, is one of the ones that I think gets a lot of attention. Uh, I've had other magicians come up after the show and say, I, I don't know how you do that, and I don't want to know how you do that. And we didn't create it to fool other magicians, but but that is, I, I love that. To mm -hmm. be able to give another magician that sense of amazement, mm -hmm. oh, man, that's just, you know, I and, love that. And the term magician, because there's some, you know, of your fellow illusion, illusionist magicians that don't like that term. And why would you say that is? They don't like the term magician? The magician, yeah. Well, I, I think that, you know, they don't want to think of um, like card tricks or. Yeah, but you know what? I, I have to I think they feel that maybe the smaller magic has a some type of a negative image mm -hmm. to it. But I have to tell you, even the close up magic, the small magic, the card magic and magic with coins, I think it's just as beautiful is is the large mm -hmm. magic. So, you know, I'm certainly an illusionist, but, I, you know, I'm a magician as well. Cool. Well, what was your would you say big break in terms of of breaking into quote the Hollywood part of this getting you know because I mean I'm assuming 
you started out small. I mean, I always think of a magician like a one man show, and what you do is like the big Broadway production, you know. With a, but do you, would you? Is there one big break looking back that you think sort of changed the course of your career? Yeah, and it, it's so appropriate you would ask that question. Uh, this lot that we're sitting on, this studio lot that we're sitting on, uh, about 15 years ago, I filmed my first television show on this lot. And it was a show for NBC called The World's Most Dangerous Magic. And I was still living in Pittsburgh at the time. I was still in college at the time. And I took, uh, I had to get permission from my teachers to kind of cut class for a couple days. And I flew to LA and we came to this uh, studio and I did this dangerous escape and, and then went back to Pittsburgh and that aired on NBC. And that really kicked off my love of combining magic and television. And it mm -hmm. happened, that show aired the week that I graduated from college. Oh my God. So right when, you know, everybody is kind of taking that step out into the real world, it was when I said, OK, you know what? College is ending. Uh, we just did this television show. Now I'm going to follow my love of combining magic and television. So that really uh, I would have to break. say. Uh, yeah, it was a big turning point for sure. What was your what was your major in college? I'm just curious. It was business. It was marketing. Oh, well, that's perfect because you need that for the business side of what you do. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize it you know, at the time, even how much, how important it is. But you've heard it before that show business is, you know, 80% business, 20% show. I'm sure you've heard that, you know, yourself. Yeah. Uh, but it's so true. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, you have to constantly um, kind of be out there and making people aware of what you do and, and finding new ways to get yourself in front of new audiences. Uh, you know, Jasper, you know that as well as, as, well as anybody. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it was more valuable than I even realized it was at the time. Well, do do you, it's interesting. Do you, are you able to rehearse? I mean, I, I know that's a weird question, but putting on these large, huge shows like you do, um, I'm assuming there has to be rehearsals. And what goes into that part of it? Or do you save? Do you save the actual big acts to do it for the first time live? Or you know, no, no, it takes, a, and that's a very good question. You know, it takes a lot of. Uh, a lot of rehearsal. Magic is all about the details. You mm -hmm. know, when you're a magician, it, 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 it's not like if you're a musician or, or, or you're in a band. If you're a musician and you hit one wrong note in a song, uh, you know, the audience is very forgiving and you just kind of keep going and it's fine. <laughs> if you do magic and one little thing goes wrong or one little thing is off, uh, it could be devastating because it breaks the illusion of the magic. It breaks mm -hmm. the fantasy. You know, people don't, you know, they know the magic is not, they know it's an illusion. It's like when you go to see a movie, you know, it, it's not, you know, real, but you right. kind of suspend your disbelief and you get absorbed into the fantasy of it. And so, you know, making sure all those details are taken care of is essential to keeping that fantasy alive in the audience. And that's really the key to a magic show. So we rehearse Oh man, I gotta say that's again going back to that steel wall piece. That took seven years from the wow. time we had the idea to the time before it actually got in front of an audience because it just I had to keep uh, refining it and trying different things with it. And it just wasn't it wasn't perfect uh, for a long, long time. And then we finally got it there. So no, I rehearse uh, our whole team. We rehearse quite a bit. This new piece we're working on, this this sawing in half. Uh, you know, it's just in the kind of um, construction phase right now. And we'll have that in the rehearsal hall probably for three to six months before we even, you know, evaluate if we're going to put it in front of an audience or not. So, so how large is your team that you work with? I have a great team of people. Uh, you know, I have about, uh, I'm trying to count them all in my head now. We have about eight people that we travel with uh, in our immediate kind of company, dancers, stage assistants, illusion technicians, mm -hmm. uh, really good, hardworking people that make it you know, a true pleasure to kind of travel around the country. And then when we get to a new city, we pick up all of the sound people and the lighting people and the stage crews. And, and so, I mean, doing a magic show, as you guys can imagine, it just it, mm -hmm. there's so many hands, even behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Even when you see one person on stage doing something, there's 30 guys kind of backstage working mm -hmm. you know, on it. So it's, uh, it's a lot, a lot of people involved. It takes a village. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the the two TV shows you have they're they're really totally different. I'm I'm fascinated by this um, the pop TV where you go behind. I've never actually heard the term street magicians. Can you talk about that? I didn't even know what that is. So, yeah, it's it's a really interesting concept. What what they wanted to do with with Don't Blink was take magic away from the stage 
and put it in real life situations. So, and not just kind of close up magic, but large scale illusions too. And it's being done in really spontaneous ways. So I'll give you an example. We went to Hollywood Boulevard and I levitated 10 feet in the air above Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, and this was this was at nighttime, just when there were tourists down there. You know, it's always very crowded down there. Right. And uh, and you really got to see what it looked like when people who didn't expect to see any of this saw something very unusual happening, and they gathered around, and you kind of really get to see the responses and see their reactions to the magic in that unique environment. Uh, so the whole show is about that. It's about putting magic into real life situations and watching people respond. And it was so much fun. We went to Venice Beach. Hollywood Boulevard, we went over to the Grove, we went to uh, Universal City Walk, and we just did various illusions in, in these environments. And, and it was it was a blast. It really, really was. And there is so much magic. There is in each Don't Blink episode, you're going to see probably six to eight different magicians doing all different types of magic. And then you tune in the next week and there's completely different magicians and completely different magic. So if you like magic, there's just a ton of magic coming at you. And then you're getting the, it's almost like a flash mob. You're getting the reactions of, of people walking by just all of a sudden seeing this happening, not really expecting it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you imagine what it's like if you're just running an errand <laughs> and all of a sudden you see somebody floating. You know, it's a lot different than if you bought a ticket to a magic show and we're, we're expecting to see, you know, something like that. So it, it, it's really, you know, as I talk about it, I'm kind of reliving some of the responses or some of the, rea the, the faces of the people that I got to see. Uh, and it was wonderful. It was it was great. It really makes you as a magician um, appreciate how you can give people that sense of amazement. But if, at the same time, I'm thinking uh, little things may happen, something may go wrong that we, the you know, general public, we won't even know it. There's something wrong. But have you had? I guess that happens where things don't always go perfectly. I mean, only probably you and the the team know what's happening. But have you had any? situations that come to mind where be it either on the show or in one of your live shows where it, it a, a trick clearly did not work and the audience could tell or are you able to always sort of um you know mask that well thankfully as you're asking or do we question, not talk about that <laughs> no, no no i'll tell you i've got to tell you i cannot think of one instance where anything knock on wood where anything has gone wrong to the point where the audience was aware of it mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that things don't go unexpected things don't happen but our group is kind of uh, you know we know the pieces in our show we rehearse them so much that we kind of put backup plans into place so if something goes right. wrong people spring into action really fast and unless the audience knows what's going to happen they yeah. don't know that they're watching a plan B happening so that's happened a number of times um, but there's never been anything that's been catastrophic like you know not putting this the woman sod in half together uh or uh you know falling when you're trying to float or anything like that that thankfully has has never happened so what are we going to see this friday on the season finale well there is a, you know of masters of illusion there's just there's a ton of magic there's two episodes airing back to back this friday mm -hmm. so viewers are going to see probably about 10 different illusionists mm -hmm. and the premise of masters of illusion is the producers kind of search the world for <clears throat> excuse me who they felt were the best magicians and illusionists mm -hmm. and invited them to hollywood to bring their best stuff so you're seeing people from all over the world showing off what they feel are their best illusions okay. so there is just again a ton of magic i don't want to spoil any surprises mm -hmm. and tell you exactly what you're going to see but you're going to see just, it's going to be, you know, an hour of back-to-back of -back action pack magic. Cool. Yeah. Do, do, are you finding the, the audiences expanding in terms of, it seems like it's, uh, it, it's something that families really enjoy also, you know, watching these kind of shows. Yeah, and that's one of the things I'm most proud of of both these shows is that they're shows that entire families can kind of gather around the television and watch mm -hmm. and enjoy. A lot of the notes that I get, and the feedback I get from people um, who are so kind to write say that, you know, we watch with, with our family every Friday or we'll tape it and, you know, our kids will just rewatch it all weekend. And, uh, you know, in today's TV landscape, shows like that are becoming fewer and fewer. Uh, and so I think that that's it's a big plus that these shows kind of fit that fit that need. So I'm very, very proud of that. Well, it's like one of the positive parts of reality. This is a reality show, but instead of being salacious and, you know, people fighting, it's some, like you said, it's a show that everyone can watch together and there's no weave pulling or anything unless... <laughs>
unless that's part of the trick. <laughs> Thank God. No, you know what? You're right. It's it's a hundred percent positive. And the also the other the other interesting thing about it is hopefully you know with young people watching or people of any age, it kind of shows you know what here are guys doing what they love to do. If they're out there doing what they love to do, um, in, in you know a unique fields such as magic where there isn't like a set road path how do you become a you know professional magician but look mm -hmm. these guys are doing it then maybe i can do what i want to do maybe i can go after what i want so i think there's a lot of uh you know positivity to to the show in that regard as well well you mentioned earlier about other magicians you know in the like in the stand-up comedy world there there's comedians are you know there's a camaraderie do you find that with other illusionists and magicians you guys all tend to know each other or support each other it magic is a, the magic world is a very small uh much like the comedy world yeah everybody kind of knows everybody and I, I love watching you know other magicians and and kind of um you know cheering them on i i think that the more magicians are out there working uh and the more magicians are amazing the most people possible the more magic's going to grow and the more it's going to reach people so yeah you know i i think uh you know that is certainly a part of the business unfortunately I think a lot of the people will tell you, a lot of magicians will tell you that, you know, we're so busy kind of working on our next thing that we don't get a chance to see as much magic as we would like. I would love to, you know, take even a night and just go see a magic show somewhere, but I don't get a chance to do it as much. Well, I guess not. You're so busy. I, I see that you've been a member, you're at the Magic Castle for those of us here in Los Angeles. That's a very iconic place um, in Hollywood. Um, do you remember the first time? Well, how do you actually, that's a big rite of passage to even be invited to perform there, right? Very much so. Very much so. When I first came to Los Angeles to tape the television show, uh, I wasn't even living here at the time, but we stayed in the hotel that was right across the street mm -hmm. from the Magic Castle. So I could look out my window and, and see it. And it was like, wow, that, there's the Magic Castle right there. I'd read about that when I was a kid. So I walked across the street and I had just turned 21 and you have to be 21 to become a member. I had literally just turned 21 that month so um i kind of went up there and and uh went in and said you know what do i have to do how do i you know become a member and <clears throat> they were auditioning people that week so i went in and, and performed for them and became a member and then um performed there kind of shortly after and it was great it was it was um such a thrill it's such a historic place for magic oh yeah i mean i've been there a few times and i i know it was even a big deal for the magician who invited me to even get me in, you know, and it was, um, yeah. yeah, I was fascinated. It's a beautiful place for those of those listeners who are not here in Los Angeles. You could go, I'm sure Google the magic castle and see the building. And, um, yeah, there's just so much history and it's like every room, there's something different going on. Oh, it, it's one of a kind. I mean, it's an old mansion that was built, I believe around 1906 that was converted into this basically a dinner theater but they've made you know they've maintained a very formal atmosphere you have to wear you know suit and tie for for men and, and dresses for ladies and uh which i think is great to uphold that yeah. kind of because again you don't see that much anywhere today anymore either but that that formal kind of um uh atmosphere in there is, is wonderful so it's a great it's a great uh you know night out anytime somebody comes to town i try and uh you know if i'm here i try and take them over so they can they can see it now, are you based now out of Los Angeles? Do you have a home base, or are you on the East Coast? Or I'm based in Los Angeles, but uh, I was just telling your producers uh, that I feel like you know I'm I'm on planes more than I'm you know on right. the freeways here. I I'm in LA probably about twenty percent of the year, and the rest we're traveling around. Um, but I am based here in 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 LA. Do you find? Audience is different in terms in the United States as opposed to Europe and other countries. I'm assuming you've traveled the world. Yeah, you know what? It's it's audiences are um, they're the same in a lot of ways, no matter where you go. And one of the th great things about magic is even when you go international, even if they don't understand the language, because magic is such a purely visual art form, mm -hmm. you're gonna get it. You're gonna understand what's going on. Um, but there's little nuances of the show, like, you know, in some cities, uh, a certain illusion will get a really strong response, really strong response. And then you'll go to, a, to maybe, you know, you'll cross the country and go somewhere else and a different illusion will get that really strong response. So I think different pieces connect differently with different people and, the, you know, it, geographically. And I, I don't know exactly why that is, but essentially I found that audiences are, they're the same 
you know, all over. I think they like to feel that sense of amazement, which is uh, which is pretty rare. You know, we don't get to feel amazement too much through our daily lives. So I think they really enjoy having that chance when they, you know, when they can. Well, do you find too now it's you're having to sort of constantly up the bar in terms of your act, you know, raise the bar because audience it's, we everyone's such adrenaline junkies now and there's so many reality shows about, you know, jumping out of buildings and high wires and you know all that stuff is do you feel the pressure to sort of constantly by well, I guess that pressure it's it's part of keeping the show better and making it better each time. Yeah, well, yes and yes. So, yeah, you you know, you definitely feel that need to at least I certainly do to constantly enhance and grow my show and to give audiences new and different things. Um, because I think people expect it and that's what keeps it exciting for them. But also for, for me and our group, we love that idea of, you know, changing our show and revising it and putting new things in. Um, but the other thing is too, is that, you know, it's, it's not even so much is, is the pressure of it. I'm, I'm a very big competitor with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't really compete with other magicians, but I compete with myself tremendously. And I right. want this year's show to be better than last year's show. I want next year's show to be better than this year's show. So I'm always trying to find ways to top myself. And, and I love that. I got to tell you, the, the, one of the most satisfying things of, of parts of my job is bringing those ideas to life. Uh, you know, just waking up one morning and saying, you know what, I want to... You know, I want to float in the air. How can I do that? I mean, what other job lets you do that? Right. right? <laughs> Without so, drugs. Right, right. Well, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's, it's, I, I love that. So it, what's, if, if somebody locked me in a room and said, we're locking you in a room for a week and your job for a week is just to come up with a hundred new magic tricks, I would be, that would be the happiest point in my life. You would love it. I'd love it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, I know, JW, we have a couple of videos you'd like to play, right? Yes, we do. Tell everyone what we're going to see All here. All right. I have a video from Masters of Illusion. Okay. Going to play. Great. Give and, everyone uh, a little taste of the show. Yeah, just to give them a little taste. So we'll go play that video right now. Michael Grandinetti is one of our favorite magicians. Let me warn you, he has an attraction for valuable objects. Thank you, everyone. I want to show you some sleight of hand magic, and I'm going to need your help. Is there anybody here who has a necklace like a bar? If you do, please raise your hand. You do? Would you come up here? Give her a hand as she joins us. How are you? What's your name? Allie. Allie, come with me. You having fun tonight? Yes. Wonderful. Stand right here. That's a beautiful necklace. Would you mind taking it off? I promise it'll be safe, and I promise we'll give it back to you. Now, everybody else, I want you to watch this very closely. Okay. I'll take it. Now, I am going to hold it up so that our camera can come in and do a really tight shot of this necklace. Now, Allie watches very closely. You and I are gonna do some magic together. The necklace goes down to my hand. And I'm gonna do this slowly. Okay. And cover my wrist with your left hand. Now, I'm gonna open my hand so the necklace is right between our palms. Can you feel it? Yes. Yeah? Rub your hand over mine. And it's done. Lift up your hand. It's gone. Now, I promise to give it back, and you're going to get it back in a very unusual way. Watch. Now, everybody keep your eye on this clear glass box. Everybody, take a look at her neck. Something look familiar? Yeah. We'll give that back to you. And you can see it's perfectly safe. Thank you so much. Give her a very big hand. Thank you guys so much. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
Thank you. That that is one of my favorite kind of new illusions that we uh, have in our show. I'm, I'm glad you guys like that. Thank you. Yeah, and just a reminder, everyone, the season finale is this Friday at 8 p.m. on the CW, uh, Masters of Illusion, and we're we are joined in studio by. Uh, Michael Grandinetti, and the show is going so fast, buddy. We need like three hours, I, you know, to talk to you. I have so many uh, questions. I could talk to you forever. You've so, made the time disappear. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you again for coming in. But um, so, in terms of your live shows, what's coming up next, um, and where can people find you? Well, we are traveling the country a lot. So, uh, in about three weeks, we're going to be in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, doing a show with the Huntsville Symphony Orchestra where the orchestra is going to be on stage surrounding us while we perform the magic, providing live music for the magic. So I'm really excited about that. We've actually figured out illusions uh, that involve the orchestra as well. The orchestra is going to do, the entire orchestra uh, is going to do magic together. Uh, the conductor is going to appear and disappear at certain points in time, and uh, it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And then our, our standard road show, we're traveling to cities all over from, from you know Dallas, Texas, to Orlando, to... Uh, New York, then we're going back up to Canada, and so we're on the road quite a bit. So if you see a magician coming to town uh, with a big, long Italian last name, uh, <laughs> like I said earlier, it's it's, it's probably me. Uh, it's I'd love you. for you to, I'd love for you know people to come and, and see our show. I really I really would. Well, if they go to your website, do you have the show show dates and stuff on there as well? Yeah, and we we keep it on our website as well as our social media. So by all means, connect with me on Twitter and on Facebook and. Uh, we're very diligent about letting people know, you know, exactly where we're going to be. And before you go, I wanted to, one question. I did want to ask you: if, if there's a young person, wa you know, watching or listening today, and and they have this passion and they don't quite know what to do with it, what what advice would you have for them to start out? I, I think that's an important question. I think first of all, if if you want to be a magician, go for it. You know, do it. Follow your passion in life, which is what I would tell anybody. Find your passion. Follow your passion. Uh, if you're a young, uh, a young boy or a young girl and you're interested in magic, I would say learn as much as you can about it and get out there and perform as much as you can for family, for friends. Uh, just do as much magic as you can. It'll really help you get comfortable and uh, really kind of get a, a sense of what it's like to perform. Um, and then once you, you know, do that, set some goals for yourself of, of some shows that you want to do maybe at local places around town or, uh, or wherever, and then try and find ways to meet those goals. But I would say, you know, let your passion really push you as far as you can with the magic. And, uh, you know, I, I think even if you do it, even if you don't do magic as a professional, uh, you could have fun with magic in, in so many ways. So, uh, go for it is what I would tell anybody who's interested in magic. You know, I tell young young actors ask me that question about how to break into business, and mm -hmm. exactly what I always say to actors: wherever you are, just act. You don't have to be in Hollywood. You don't have to be in New York. Take advantage mm -hmm. of whatever opportunities in front of you. And like you said, if you have the passion, you're not, and don't do it to become famous. Right. You know, do it because you have a love of the of the art, and and the rest will fall into place. You know, that's you just have to follow your passion. I agree 100%. You know, what carried me forward was my love of magic. Uh, I, like I said earlier, I was very goal-driven. But, you know, if I had never done television, if I had never, I'd be just as happy doing magic, you know, for one or two people anywhere because that's what I love. That's what I right. do. So, you know, all the other stuff, the television, the big illusions, uh, that's the icing on the cake. You know, but just being able to do magic, uh, you know, it makes me the happiest guy in the world. So I think that's what people need to follow. Well, listen, buddy, your passion comes through. Your your joy for what you do is authentic. Everyone can see it. It's a pleasure to meet you. Congratulations. Best of luck on the two uh, TV shows and, of course, on all your, on your uh, road shows. And hopefully you'll come back and see us again real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. I, I really, really appreciate it. It's been fantastic talking with you. Thanks, buddy. And, everyone, the time is going, but be, be sure and join us uh, Next Wednesday, we're going to have our Ralph Cole Jr. and Dara Zane Scully, my former cohorts on my other show. We're going to be doing a whole Hot Topics show with another special uh, uh, guest. And uh, Dominic, JW, thank you so much as always. Always a pleasure, Jasper. Thank you. See you next week. And everyone, please uh, know that this will be on iTunes and Stitcher and everywhere. And spread the word. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. 
Thanks so much for watching and listening. You've been listening and watching One on One with Jasper Cole, and we will see you next week. Take care. Thanks for checking out One on One with Jasper Cole. Check out past episodes and get the latest Jasper release. Subscribe today on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube.